I don't know if that's recording. Yes, it is. Yes, yes, okay. Okay, hi everyone um, and welcome to our first session of 2021 and thanks uh, to all of you who've joined. It's great to see so many in attendance. Um, so today's session will be a slightly different to the other sessions we've had. So we're going to be discussing a paper uh, related to open science topics. So Laura has prepared a presentation on a paper um, that looks at common statistical mistakes that we should all watch out for as both kind of authors and, and reviewers as well. And then later on in the session, we're going to be joined by Dr. Aileth um, Ewing, who's going to tell us about some statistical seminar series that are, are on in the university. So I'll hand it over to, to Laura now, but before I do, we're going to have about a 35 minute presentation to kind of 40 minutes. And then afterwards we'll have a Q&A session as always. So the first half of the presentation, or the first, the presentation will be recorded um, and then we'll turn it off with the discussion. So over to you, Laura. Yes, thanks, Niamh. <laughs> Sounds a bit like a TV show. <laughs> um, so welcome back everyone. Um, today um, we have, like Niamh said, a paper on statistics. Uh, first, I'm going to start with a little disclaimer. Um, then, oh, feedback here. Alex. I don't know what that is. Uh, I think Alex is not muted. I'm just going to mute everyone. And unmute Laura. Yes, <laughs> sorry. Um, right, so then I'm going to just quickly introduce the topic and the article of today, summarize that article. Um, I'll be referring to some um, resources uh, on statistics, both in the public domain and for the University of Edinburgh specific. Um, then uh, Dr. Elith Ewing will talk a little bit more about the IGMM statistical seminar series and another project she's working on, and we'll end with a discussion. So let's dive right in. Um, first of all, I am no expert on statistics. I will just be attempting to summarize this article. Um, if you see me make any big mistakes or you have anything to share, feel free to pitch in. Um, you can do so by raising your hand or um, making a comment in the chat, uh, but be aware that the presentation will be recorded. And afterwards, we'll make the summary slides with a little bit more text available so you can um, refer to them. So why should we be talking about statistics? Um, transparency and open research practices are particularly crucial in complex and sometimes scary aspects of research like statistics can be. Um, this can be very intimidating, so it's especially important to talk about it and yeah, be open about what we're actually doing. And it's a problem because much of the published research actually contains a lot of flawed and non-transparent methods. So yeah, we should just encourage more open and non-judgmental discussions in which we can all improve our statistical um, knowledge. So today's article is um, the 10 common statistical mistakes to watch out for when writing or reviewing a manuscript. Uh, it was um, authored by Professor Tamar Makin and Professor Jean-Jacques Aubin de Sifri. And um, they're both um, neuroplasticity researchers. And um, yeah, I'll say a little bit more about that later. So this article was published in eLife and eLife is uh, a journal that's really at the forefront of all these open research developments. It has a lot of um, yeah, strong claims and mission about um, promoting open research culture and also is um, the first uh, journal that will um, adopt a preprint first publishing model. So they're going to just uh, focus their efforts on like reviewing and evaluating uh, already published research, um, which is very, very modern, I would say. And I was just browsing through uh, the eLab website and then I came across this um, paper that they refer um, authors to uh, want to submit in eLab. Um, so this, this paper is um, mostly inspired by neuroscience papers, but it's broadly applicable, the themes that are discussed. Um, it does limit itself to classical or frequentist statistics, so um, it doesn't really go into depth on, on Bayesian alternatives. Um, we might do a session on that later in the year, but this is really more um, yeah, restricting itself to working with p-values. Um, and the, the problems mentioned here are kind of a mixture of design, stats and inference problems, not just purely statistical problems. 
And for each problem, they describe the problem, uh, how to detect it, and also some solutions or damage control options for researchers. So these are the 10 uh, points made. This is why I'm going through it rather quickly, um, because we have a lot of information to discuss. Um, yeah, I'll just I'll just go through it. Um, this is just a summary, but I'll go over each point uh, separately. So first of all, we have um, the absence of a, an, an adequate control condition or a control group. So this applies to wh both whether you're working with humans or whether you're working with cells in a petri dish. Um, if you have any type of intervention and experimental design with a pre and post measurement, it's really important to be able to separate this from the effect of time passing by. And so a control group or control condition is very important here. And um, ideally they have identical designs. So they should have the same sample size, same kind of time different time span between pre and post and the same kind of measurements. And to improve, further improve validity of a good um, control condition, you should consider randomly allocating uh, subjects or samples to um, a specific condition or group. And if you have a, an intervention and um, you need to have a control ag against that intervention, it's better to, in some cases at least, to have a sham intervention than to just have nothing at all because it's more similar to have a sham intervention. So say with uh, the COVID-19 vaccine trials, um, you, if, you if you are in the placebo and in the control group, you will still get a placebo injection because if you just don't have to show up to the hospital, it's a very different experience, of course, and it's harder to actually validly compare the two groups. Um, and then also um, the issue of blinding. So to further improve the validity of such a control condition is to blind both the participants, the researchers and the people eventually analyzing the results. And what should you do if this goes wrong? Um, just be transparent about it and uh, be open about the limitations to your conclusion. Right, moving on to number two, indirect comparisons. Um, I've definitely seen this in a lot of papers. Um, and I think it's not necessarily a wrong procedure, but depending on how you, yeah, what you claim all about it, um, you can go into um, a bit of a gray area here. So say someone says there was a significant correlation in the experimental group, but not in the control group. Therefore, the experimental group differs significantly from the control group. So what you're doing is you're running separate tests and you're comparing just those test outcomes and thereby basing a conclusion of the on the difference between the groups. But here you should actually formally just compare the data gathered in both groups. And um, therefore this kind of yeah, claim is um, unfounded. And uh, the authors show some examples here. So um, you see uh, in, the, in panel A, you see group A and B, uh, Pearson R correlations are uh, calculated for both groups and as you can see the lines are incredibly close to each other so they do not differ really <laughs> um, but the thing is that the group A line um, correlation just about reaches significance level which is of course an arbitrary level and group B doesn't and therefore you could say that they um, they have different results but you can say that they significantly differ from each other and the same uh, yeah example kind of you can see in uh, the right panel, um, where pre and post test differences are compared, um, in both group C and group D, uh, the means are the same, but the, the spread, the variance in group D is just larger. And so when, they, uh, when the authors um, performed one sample T test in each of these groups, um, group C um, showed a significant test result, uh, whereas group D didn't. Um, but it would be un, uh, yeah, un, invalid to say that uh, group C therefore has a bigger effect than group D, because if you actually formally compare the difference between groups by doing an independent um, t-test, as you can see in the top part here, um, this doesn't even approach a significant difference. So uh, the groups are very, very similar. So um, 
the solution to this problem is to just do it. <laughs> Formally compare the groups. Um, one alternative to compare correlations is to use Monte Carlo simulations, which are linked. A uh, link is here provided to for more information about that and group comparisons using, for instance, t-tests, ANOVAs, or non-parametric alternatives. All right, number three, inflating the unit of analysis. Um, so when you're, when you're answering a research question, you should think about what um, units of analysis you need to draw a conclusion um, on for that research question. And unit of analysis, um, or in this case is the number of independent observations or values that are free to vary. And in classical or frequentist statistics, this is also known as the degrees of freedom. And importantly, if your degrees of freedom increase, your statistical significance threshold decreases. And that's kind of because of yeah, roughly the, um, the fact that you have more independent information, so you would have more confidence in the conclusion that you draw from this. So um, let's go over an example. Say you have a research question. Um, can income level, level be, be predicted by depression status? And to answer this question, you have a longitudinal design or, or to have yeah, your, data, your available data is from a longitudinal design with a therapy intervention and pre and post measurements on both depression status and income level um, yeah, before and after this intervention. You have 10 people in your sample and the statistical significance threshold is 0.05. Um, and the example uh, used by authors is a simple linear regression. Um, and now you have to think about, OK, so what is my unit of analysis? What, what am, am I going to look at um, to answer this question? Because you could um, look at the subjects. So that's 10 subjects you have. Um, if you do a simple linear regression, you have to take off two from your degrees of freedom. You end up with eight degrees of freedom, which um, yeah makes your the absolute um, the critical absolute value of the regression coefficient. So that's this correlation actually between x, x and y um, has to be 0.63 in order for it to be or higher for in order for it to be significant or stamped as significant. However, if you would say, oh, I'm going to look at all the observations that I have, um, so that is all the pre and post measurements from everyone, you would have 20 observations, which would increase your degrees of freedoms to 18 and really reduce that uh, size of the correlation you need to find in order to um, yeah, have that in be indicated as a significant correlation. And what's really important in making this decision is really keeping in mind the independence of observations and also to, in, to distinguish between uh, subject um, variables from within subject variables. Because here in this, um, in this um, research question, of course, the, ob the observations aren't independent if you measure them within the same people. So um, it's actually not appropriate in this case to select that second row with the observations as your units of analysis. And some solutions to the problem are um, using a linear uh, mixed effects model. And here's some more information about that. Uh, I think specific to neuroscience that is here. Um, and in this kind of model, you can, um, you can both model um, within subject effects that are fixed and between subject effects that are allowed to vary and without um, violating the assumption of independence. So this is a very kind of modern and uh, increasingly popular alternatives to use. And some other uh, alternatives specifically to simple regre regression include to use the observations, but still to use the more conservative degrees of freedom or to average the correlations for the pre and post observations so that you have one data point per individual. OK, moving on. <laughs> Uh, spurious correlations. Um, so a correlation assesses the magnitude of association between two variables. And there are um, several parametric uh, kinds of correlations that you can use. So that's saying something about population as a whole rather than just your sample. Uh, but to, to have or to conduct a kind of um, parametric 
uh, test, you should always consider the assumptions um, that go with a test like that. And in this case, and uh, correlations, quite often there are problems with the assumptions about outliers and um, independence of observations again, but this time in terms of uh, clusters and subgroups. And the authors have uh, run some simulations to um, yeah, demonstrate this point. So in the top row here, uh, plot A to C, you see um, a random uh, simulation of two uncorrelated uh, variables with 19 samples and one extra data point, and they statistic or sim systematically <laughs> increase this uh, distance between this point and the rest of the data. And as you can see, this single point is completely driving this um, spurious correlation and um, causes this art artificial increase. So um, yes, that's for the for the outlier problem, and. In the uh, bottom row of D to F, they um, have again uh, simulated two uncorrelated variables with 20 samples that were arbitrarily divided into two groups. And then they increased that distance between the two groups systematically. And you can see that there's again a, uh, an artificial inflation of this Pearson R correlation going on here. Um, because if you would um, separate the groups and actually like run the correlation within each group, you would not get this kind of correlation plot. So they haven't considered the, the clustering effect in their samples. So if you're a reviewer and you have to decide if the authors have done this properly or not in the paper that you're reviewing, um, some things you can uh, look for are whether a scatter plot is provided. So you can actually see the spread of the data points. Um, is there a description of the outlier management and uh, justifications for why they removed it or why they have not removed certain outliers? Um, if data is pulled together from different sources, so for instance, from different data sets, um, have they really investigated any systematic between group differences that could drive um, these kinds of uh, spurious correlations? And they also offer some solutions in this article for uh, researchers, and one of them is to use more robust correlation methods, such as um, applying bootstrapping, um, which is more, um, which is less sensitive to uh, outliers. And just as a general comment, just always check your assumptions before using a parametric, parametric method. Right. Okay. Next point. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm rushing through this a bit, but there's just so much to talk about. Um, yes, small sample size. Oh. Um, the significance fallacy here uh, described here is um, when people kind of yeah, fall into the trap of, think, of thinking along the lines of, oh, if the effect size is that big with the sample size only being that small, the effect just has to be true because um, how else could you, could you find an effect if you um, yeah, if only such a small sample size. But actually using small samples increases a lot of risks of error. Um, so first of all, the you, you tend to overestimate um, correlations and that could be false positive correlations. So um, the authors of the paper ran a simulation to compare um, uh, the distribution of false positive correlations in um, so they use two uncorrelated variables again to, to render this simulation. And the false positive correlations found with uh, a sample size of 15 were uh, ranging between 0.5 and 0.75. And the simulations with a sample size of 100 ranged between 0.2 and 0.25. So um, even though they don't formally compare <laughs> these differences, you can still see that there's the range just don't overlap at all and that it's um, you just get bigger um, overestimations for smaller sample size here. Um, also, uh, having a small sample size increases your type 1 and type 2 error risks, and um, your, your uh, distribution in a small sample size is more likely to deviate from the normal distribution and also have more extreme outliers, which could, for instance, again, lead to spurious correlations. 
So what to do if you have a small sample size? Well, first of all, you can try to prevent it <laughs> by doing a power analysis and seeing how big your sample size should be if you want to um, detect a certain effect of, of a known or, or at least an estimated effect size. Um, you, yeah, it's, it's of course best to do this before you actually run the analysis, but if you've already run the analysis and you kind of want to see how bad it was <laughs> or, or in which context you should interpret your small sample, there is a Bayesian post hoc alternative to, uh, or to calculate your power. Um, and you can go to this link for more information. Um, yeah, and afterwards the presentation will of course be shared and you can visit all these links through the presentation. Um, also, the authors note that if you have a specifically uh, difficult population to, to, to sample uh, large samples from, you could consider doing more replications both within and between subjects and to also use uh, controls, for instance, to establish confidence intervals with a small sample. OK, um, yes, next point, basically recycling your data set. Um, circular analysis is the problem of uh, using your data to both identify your variables of interest and then to also make statistical inferences from them. So you may have heard of the term double dipping. This is what that refers to. Um, one example is that you, you look at your data already and then uh, retrospectively you decide to divide or reduce that data, for instance, by uh, creating subgroups or defining a region of interest based on the activity levels you've already seen, for instance, in the brain. I'm just thinking of a brain example. Um, or removing uh, outliers or what you could consider outliers anyways. So basically you're se selecting the noise that fits your hypothesis. Um, and that's actually, yeah, that's inflating and invalidating your uh, statistical inferences. So if you're a reviewer and you need to detect this, um, well, sometimes you can clearly see that the data have just been selected for showing an effect of interest. Um, another red flag is high effect sizes that just seem implausible based on the theory, um, or effect sizes based on unreliable measures, for instance, with a really poor internal consistency. They're kind of like, um, they have error to, to kind of pick and choose from. Um, right, so what are some solutions? Oh, of course, to set them, set the criteria before you do the analysis. Um, alternatively, you could try and look for a different data set to um, either get your um, criteria from or to make your statistical inferences from. Or if you really only have your own data set, you can see, could consider splitting that data set into two. And um, to not lose a lot of power, you could uh, again, apply bootstrapping, so like resampling again and again um, to still find the effects, and but do so in a uh, split and independent way. And also you could run some uh, simulations to demonstrate that the data is maybe not uh, tied to your specific noise distribution or your specific selec selection criteria. Right. So, okay. Number seven, we're already at number seven flexibility of analysis or um, p-hacking. It is not that difficult to find a significant p-value <laughs> as long as you just keep trying different ways. Um, so the more sources of variation in an analysis pipeline there are, the greater the likelihood is that you will come across a false positive at some point. Um, so uh, some sources of variation could be uh, adding more or less covariates, changing pre-processing procedures, or excluding outliers post hoc. And they could all help you to find that significant peak value if that's what you're going for. But of course, you shouldn't be going for that. Um, there's a, the problem in this in this um, for this problem is is just the lack of transparency again about people not saying what they're going to do and then just being able to try out anything uh, to find a positive um, or significant p-value. And this is also really related to the file draw problem, which is where basically it's the, the significant findings are really rewarded with publications and non-significant findings are kind of asked to be put in the file drawer. Um, and they kind of disappear that way. So 
of course there are, there are um, some movements in the open research movements um, that are trying to combat this problem. And um, one of them is pre-registration. And that's good because p-hacking is very difficult to detect for reviewers without pre-registration. Um, what you can still look for in articles is whether there are justifications given for uh, analytical choices, um, whether the same analysis plan was used in previous publications, uh, if there were questionable new variables introduced, or maybe if they collected a large battery of measures but only reported those few significant findings. So solutions for researchers is to be transparent. Um, it's also wise to separate your confirmatory from your exploratory analysis and be again transparent about this. And um, if you want to learn more about how to pre-register an analysis plan, you can have a look at our session from December, um, which is here you can find on YouTube and the resources on our OSF page. Um, and um, Dr. Hilary uh, Richardson and Zach, Dr. Zach Horn um, explain about uh, pre-registrations in the session. So I would recommend you going there if you want to learn more about that. OK, almost there. Uh, statistical mistake number eight, failing to correct for multiple comparisons. If you do a lot of tests, you uh, inflate your, your risk of, of having a type one error, so a false positive um, in, in at least one of those tests. So you're looking at the family wise error rate in that case. Um, it's a particular problem with exploratory analysis because they're less constrained than the confirmatory analysis that you do based on a specific hypothesis. And also there are uh, common problems in working with large data sets where you need to make many independent comparisons. So for instance, that is the case with looking at uh, brain voxels, depending of course on which kind of analysis you do, um, or genetics. And the, the, the infamous dead Selman experiment is a good example of this, in which the authors have found um, brain activation in a dead Selman when they didn't correct for multiple comparisons, but when they did, the activation disappeared, fortunately, so it works. <laughs> um, some solutions are Bonferroni or FDR analysis, and you can look at this for a uh, source for some more information on types of uh, corrections. OK, number nine. Um, yes, this was an interesting point, overinterpreting non-significant results. So I thought it would be good to maybe start with what is a significant result or what is a p-value actually? Um, the p-value is the probability of obtaining the observed data or more extreme data under the null hypothesis. And so it's the probability of the data, not the probability of the hypothesis, which is often um, misinterpreted. And if you see something like this in a paper, um, the p-value was non-significant, therefore there was no effect. Um, without any other context, then that's a bit shady, or a bit dodgy, I should say, um, because there are also alternative explanations for not finding a, a significant p-value, which could be that the study was underpowered or the effect is just ambiguous. So we require more context to interpret a non-significant finding. And um, some things you could do to provide that context are to report effect sizes, um, power analysis, or you could just opt to describe your results as non-significant, but don't overinterpret them as evidence against your hypothesis. And last but not least, uh, the well-known mistake of um, interpreting correlation as a causation, um, because correlation indicates an association, but it cannot um, indicate the direction of the association or whether there are any confounding factors. So um, what you can do or what you should be wary of if you're reviewing an article is when they uh, use um, causal language to describe an association that is unrelated uh, to an experimental manipulation. Um, and also if you're the researcher doing this, um, you should um, either find some support for those causal interpretations, for instance, by exploring um, the uh, potential confounding variables, 
through, for instance, hierarchical mod modeling or mediation analysis if you have the power, or to basically add a new study and manipulate that variable you're interested in, or maybe more, much more simply, just to, use, to not use causal language to describe your findings. Right, so now we're at the part um, yeah, where we just want to share a lot of resources with you in case you want to um, yeah, upskill your, your statistics. Um, so there are many platforms online, such as Coursera and edX. I personally am quite enjoying this course uh, on improving your statistical inferences um, by Daniel Lacus. <laughs> um, <laughs> where um, there's also some uh, interesting courses on MIT. Um, Open Intro has some books available uh, that have been uh, also good to, uh, or recommended by at least one person in our group. Um, and Adam Barr, I'm not sure if I'm saying it right, uh, I came across uh, just the other day, and they seem to be an Edinburgh R user group and who meet every third Wednesday of each month. So I thought it was just nice to give them a little shout out. And they also discuss uh, statistics in, um, yeah, within the R uh, community, R user group. Um, right, and then uh, other resources, some more informal resources could be uh, forums uh, where people can exchange questions and answers. Um, there are a lot of podcasts available on statistics as well. I just mentioned two here. Um, there are Facebook groups on specific topics you could consider joining, of course. Um, YouTube uh, channels that offer a lot of explanations, such as Khan Academy. Um, and there's some, uh, some, I just listed a few random Twitter pages here that I follow. And I quite like the slightly cringy, um, yeah, statistical jokes here with, for some reason, created by a fan group from uh, Mark Wahlberg. I don't know who made that connection, but uh, I like it. Um, and then uh, at the university here of Edinburgh, we have a couple of interesting resources available as well, such as the Statistical Consultancy Unit, um, which you can, I think, hire as, uh, yeah, to inform your or your statistics. You have to put that in your, um, in your uh, grant, but, um, they offer some useful um, yeah, advice and also an R course is available through that unit as well, I think. Um, the, the Institution for Academic Development um, has some courses and consultancy sessions aimed at postgraduate students. Um, and the, the XDF training resources are more aimed at postdoctoral researchers and it's also kind of collected list of resources available there. Base Center offers some more um, uh, courses for also, I think, um, professionals in um, maybe more senior positions. Um, and uh, a really good uh, resource that um, was made last year by uh, Dr. Elith Ewing and Dr. Catalina Vallejos, if I'm saying that right, is the IJMM uh, Statistical Seminar Series. And so we have Dr. Elith Ewing here um, today to uh, discuss a little bit more with us about what they've done in this series, how it came about, and I'd like to hand over to her if that's okay. Are you? Yeah, of course. Yes. Uh, thanks. Um, I will just share my screen. Can you see that? Yes, we can, yes. Yeah, great. Um, so by way of introduction, I'm Dr. Elith Ewing. Um, I'm a Chancellor's Fellow at the IGMM, so the Institute of Genetics and Molecular Medicine. Um, but I'm a statistician originally. Uh, and myself and Catalina Valios, who uh, is also a Chancellor's Fellow in the Institute, um, have been thinking for some time that although there are lots, as Laura mentioned, of statistical resources out there, um, there aren't that many that are focused towards biomedical research, which is obviously the sort of research that happens in the Institute and is of interest to many of the staff and students that work there. Uh, so we wanted to try and fill that gap a little bit and create a resource 
uh, that was specific to our research um, that was accessible to as many people as possible and would help um, to sort of a raise awareness of the importance of statistics to reproducibility as well as other things. Um, so for these reasons and a few others, we created the statistical seminar series, um, which ran for the first time uh, earlier this year uh, in lockdown. Originally it was designed to run in person, but then obviously everything had to move online. Um, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit more about that. Um, so the seminar se series itself uh, is 12 sessions um, by nine presenters. Um, and as I said, the aim was really to increase awareness of the important statist importance of statistics, but also to introduce a common language. Um, so, so that it's clear how to talk about particular uh, st statistical concepts and methods in order to kind of increase understanding and allow people uh, door in to how they can learn more about stats and the stuff that um, areas and stats that could be useful to them so that they can make the most out of the data that they've got, as well as to introduce uh, potential pitfalls and limitations to be aware of, like Laura's just done very well, um, really just open that door and start that conversation. Um, the presenters in the series are all volunteers, which is just amazing, and they're all students and staff um, at the IGMM, um, mainly PhD students. Uh, and the postdocs are postdocs that have backgrounds in uh, statistics, um, but also some cross-disciplinary fellows as part of the ICF scheme that Laura mentioned, um, with backgrounds, quantitative backgrounds in maths, uh, stats, um, who all talked about areas of statistics that they're more familiar working with. Um, the series went down really well. It was attended well both online but also all the sessions were recorded which is why I, well, I think Laura has invited me here so that I can tell you about the recordings they're accessible to everyone across the university so you can check them out at your own time and um, each session covers uh, a different area of statistics so you can check out the ones that are most relevant to you um, and our hope also in running it in lockdown was that we could support the training of new PhD students as they joined the institute um, and we're in many cases having to do a lot more data analysis than they may be expected to, to be doing. And also off the back of um, the series, uh, some of the statisticians who presented formed new collaborations with other groups in the unit and were asked to contribute to quite some big projects, uh, some related to COVID, um, that led to big papers that maybe they, particularly the students wouldn't have been asked to do previously. So that was a really good opportunity for them. Um, there are also two blogs that have been written by uh, rotation um, students at the beginning of their PhD programmes uh, that are on the IGMM blog site, which you should definitely check out. One is on statistics and reproducibility, which talks about many issues that I'm sure of interest to this community. Um, but there's also another blog uh, by Ryan who talks about the importance of statistics in biomedical research and biological research in general. You're definitely great reads and definitely worth checking out. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about because I think it's of huge interest to the people here, um, is a successful funding bid that has just been awarded uh, across the university, across the School of Biological Sciences, uh, Maths, as well as uh, College of Medicine, so that's where the IGMM is a part of. Um, and this bid is to create some more data science training for healthcare and biosciences. Um, it's being led by the Human Genetics Unit, but is very applicable to uh, researchers and students across the whole university. Um, this bid has uh, won funding to develop and deliver a series of workshops that all centre around uh, data science but uh, with a focus on data management, fair principles and reproducibility which is why I thought you guys were really interested in knowing about this and these courses are going to go live um, at the end of 2021 we hope in the autumn. Um, and includes courses on statistics, um, as well as those on data management and on workflows, which might be something that you're interested in learning about. Um, all the courses follow the Carpentries format that some of you might be familiar with, but this means that they're quite scalable um, and also provide opportunities for people to be helpers or instructors on those courses and train up themselves in how to teach these things. Uh, so if you're interested in any of this, please drop me an email. Um, and we'll bear your mind to get you involved. 
um, or just keep an eye out for these uh, courses emerging in the near future. And thanks again for the opportunity to tell you about all this stuff. And if there's any questions, I'm very happy to answer them in the discussion. Great, thank you so much for that. That was a really nice um, contribution. So uh, I think we can wrap up this recorded bits for now. Yeah, so I'll just turn off the recording now.